Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we're, we're here to celebrate a life of our, our beloved uh, Warren. And Lord, we're asking right now that your Holy Spirit come down and touch each and every one of us. We all need a touch from you, Lord. And uh, whether it be for comfort, for strength, for courage, for wisdom, Lord, we're just calling on you to make, it, make yourself known. We love you, we honor you, and we praise you. Jesus' name, amen. Can we all stand, please, for this part?
You may be seated.
that was one of Warren's favorite songs. And I do believe that his goodness has run after him. And he's running after him in his family, in his children, in his grandchildren, in his friends, in the people that loved him and cherished him so much. And we absolutely cherished him. We love him at this at this church. He has just been a he always showed up for everything. Never missed an event, even if it was VBS. He was there holding the kids' feet as they were playing the games and just such a great man. If it was chocolate week, strawberry week, he showed up in force. He was calling everybody, where are you at? He worked really hard. I'm very thankful for him, and I'm sure that there will be more said about that later, but we're going to have Chris Darty, his dear friend, come up and read from the Old Testament reading. Just bear with me, if you would, a little bit. Um, this is probably one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. <coughs> Mr. Warren, Marvin, a lot of people know him at different things. I know him as Mr. Warren. I know him as my brother, somebody that I can count on, somebody that I can trust. He's one of them ones that if you went to jail, you needed to make that one phone call, he would be the one to make it to. He would answer the phone. He would be there. It didn't matter what time of the day, what time of the night. He was always there. I'm not going to be long-winded here. He doesn't like it when people just keep on carrying it out and on and on and on, and I know that about him. He wants to hear what you got to say, and let's go to the next page. I'm going to read from Psalms 148. And it says, Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him in all his angels. Praise ye him in his host. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all stars of light. Praise him in the heavens, the heavens and the waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He also established them forever and ever, and he hath made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth and from the dragons and all the depths. The fire, hail, snow, and vapor, stormy winds fulfilling his word, mountains and all the hills, fruitful trees and all the cedars, beast and all the cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all the people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and the heavens. He also exalted the horn of his people and praised of all the saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. Mr. Warren to me, and I'm not going to elaborate too much. I'm not going to take too much time, but I just want you to know that Mr. Warren was one of my most truly dear friend that I've had. I'm 57 years old and I met him and he's been one that has stood beside me. I've gone through a lot of stuff in my own life but Mr. Warren was one not to point a finger and to judge anybody. Just like God. He made the heavens, he made the earth. He made the fire, the hail, the stormy winds, the mountains, the hills, and all the cedars. He made it all. That box right there, that's all it is is a box. Mr. Warren's really not in that box. Mr. Warren is singing and dancing with Jesus today. And if he had the opportunity to come back, he wouldn't come back. 
I thank God that he didn't allow him to suffer. Mr. Warren was one that loved the church. He loved his pastor. He loved Sister Gleason. And he loved every part of this church. He found somewhere that he trusted the people here. He knew what time it was. I watched Mr. Warren get baptized in Jesus' name right over there because he read it in the Word and he believed it. And here today, all I'm going to say is this Word is our way out of here. That's it. If you don't want to hear it, don't read it. But you do need somebody to help you understand it. That's why it says you need a shepherd, you need a pastor, somebody that can interpret the Word for you and help you understand it. But I'm here to tell you today that heaven gained a wonderful person. And I just want to thank him and I want to thank everybody else here for just showing up and being part of Mr. Warren's life because if you're here, I don't have to tell you about his life. He loved each and every one of you, his grandchildren, his children, his dogs. He loved them little dogs. They were just like children to him. He's going to be very well missed. And it really is it's not going to set in right now, but Angie and Robbie, I know that y'all have taken good care of him, and I'm thankful for that. Y'all had your doors open. He loved you guys. He loved all of y'all. And I'm not going to continue on. I'm going to let somebody else come on. But I just want everybody here to know that that man was my best friend. And I'm going to miss him. And I love him.
know, my wife and I uh, moved out here uh, from California about a year and a half ago. We were welcomed at this church, and when we uh, first came in to sit down, Angela, you were the, you and your fa father were the first two to greet us. And man, what a wonderful man he was. And I mean, I'm not going to sit here and get long-winded because I'm just as hurt as anyone else here because we miss him. That's a selfish thing, but we're here to celebrate his life because he achieved our goal. Our goal is to get right with God and to go on into paradise. And he aligned his life to where he's acceptable. And uh, it's a selfish thing that we get upset because we want him still here. We want to say one more thing to him. But we can't. We need to find comfort in that. We, we need to have a trust that he went on to a better place where there is no more tears. There's no more sorrow. And he's down there look. He, I'm sure he's looking at me saying, Brother Mike, now just get done. You know, because he, just like Chris was saying, he wasn't a man of a whole lot of words. He didn't want a big, he, let's cut to the chase and let's get this thing done. And he was always here. And I really respect that man. We both were, uh, we both became deacons the very same day. And what an honor it is to stand beside that man because I felt uh, so less worthy because he was here all the time. He loved this church. I love this church too, but he just, he was an inspiration to me. With that being said, I want to um, read a scripture from uh, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, and it starts in verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The family would like for Chad Johnson to come now and to uh, share some remarks about your uncle. He was so proud of you, Chad. He talked about you all the time. I'm on. All right. So um, I'm Marvin's nephew. We call him Marvin. I don't know if any of y'all know the story of Marvin and Warren. Most people don't. Tell the story. So Marvin was born Marvin Wayne Johnson. That was his name. Mom and daddy gave him that name. Okay, so I guess you used to not get, like, birth certificates right away, and you used to didn't get uh, Social Security cards and that kind of stuff when you're born like they do now. So, uh, so Marvin, uh, they had to send off for it right before he was going into the military, and he had to get all his paperwork right. Well, apparently they sent, they sent him the birth certificate, and it had on there, Warren Wayne Johnson. So he just stayed Warren Wayne Johnson forever from, from then on out. So you could tell, like, any place that was, like, where they had to have his, like, real name, that's what they called him. Family always called him Marvin. He was always Marvin to us. But, like, people at work called him Warren. Down here, they called him Warren. He just became Warren. But uh, he was born Marvin. Uh, so we just always continued to call him. You know, it's just weird. Even now, it's weird hearing people call him Warren. I mean, because, you know, he's always been Uncle Marvin to me. 
Uh, so they picked the bad family member to talk because I could stand up here an hour and tell stories about about Uncle Marvin. Uh, he was always the fun uncle. He was always, he had a temper. Runs in the family. Uh, but he was always looking to have fun. Um, he'd come across to a lot of people as a know-it-all, and I kind of get this from him too. Uh, it's not that we're know-it-alls. It's just that we want to impart what we've learned on other people. We want to help people. Marvin would drop anything to help his worst enemy if they asked him. I'm the same way. I'd probably do it first for somebody I didn't like than I did for somebody I liked just cause, just to prove them wrong. Uh, but my dad was like that too. You know, My dad would just do anything to help people if they asked. You know, and Marvin, Marvin was the same way. And uh, like I, they, they grew up really, really poor. Uh, they were raised by their aunt. Uh, and uh, they were treated literally like Marvin always said it. They treated like the red-headed stepchildren. Uh, you know, while her kids got to go out and have a good time and, and do things as teenagers, go to movies, go to skating ring, stuff like that, um, Marvin and Daddy and, and his, their sister Margie, they had to stay on the clean. They had to wash their clothes. They had to clean the house up. They had to do that stuff. They didn't get to go out and have fun. Um, so, like I said, Marvin, uh, Marvin grew up rough. You know, him and Daddy shared a bed until until they went in the military. Uh, so him and my dad were very close. You know, uh, him and my mom didn't always get along, but Mama knew that. You know, when uh, if if it was under Marvin, if it was under my Daddy. They were going to do it with Marvin. Uh, you know, and Mama didn't never question that. But him and him and my mom, which I didn't realize, I guess, you know, my mom's birthday was December 15, 1951, so they were only a few days apart. But uh, uh, but like I said, my dad always looked out for Marvin. He always, you know, that was his little brother. Um, and my dad passed away in, in 2003. And uh, like I said, so Marvin's been the – you know, closest male in my family for, for years now. And Marvin's always been there for me. He's always, you know, anything I've asked. I was thinking, you know, after they told me I had to speak today, I was thinking, like, what can I tell? So this is the kind of stuff Marvin always taught me. So the first time when I got my driver's license, we had to go get my Aunt Sadie. I don't know if you remember Aunt Sadie. But we had to go up other side of Charlotte. This is my first time driving on the interstate. So Marvin was a truck driver. So this is my very first time, 16 years old, driving on the interstate in Charlotte. So I got the how-to drive on the interstate from a seasoned trucker. What lane to ride in, when you need to be in the left lane, when you need to be in the right lane. He said, now they say don't drive in the right lane, but if you're driving faster than everybody else, Stay in that left lane, you know, and always, you know, always give you turn signals. If, always look out for truckers, you know. He give me the whole whole spiel on, on how to how to drive on the highway. Um, like I said, that that was Marvin. Marvin just always imparted his wisdom, or like thereof sometimes, on us. You know, he wanted us to know if he knew it, dealing with tools, any kind of working with something. If he had experience doing it. He was going to tell you all the ins and outs about it. He was going to help you and want you to know what he knows about it. He didn't try to keep stuff a secret and try to make you look stupid because, you know, you don't know. Man, if he knew you didn't know, he was going to help you. He was going to show you. Like, he was always like that and, and that laugh. I'm going to miss that laugh, probably most of anything. So, I'm a, I got a degree in music, and I've – always been around music people all my friends are musicians uh you know raised in music marvin was like completely tone deaf i don't know why he didn't get in none of the music genes but his laugh was an arpeggio play my arpeggio all right basically it's it's a musical term for a chord that was his laugh 
So all my music friends, when they come around and hear Marvin laugh, they're like, why does he laugh in an arpeggio? <laughs> I mean, he laughed in a chord every single time. <laughs> it's like, but he couldn't sing. I don't know why he laughed like that, but it was the greatest thing. All my friends loved hearing him laugh. They would do things just to make him laugh just so they could hear it. I ain't never met anybody that laughed like that. And I probably will never will be anybody that laughs like that. But that laugh is probably what I'm going to miss most of all. I love that man. Taught me a lot. Thank you. I think we all love the laugh. You could pick him out in a crowd. Angela, I'm not sure if you wanted to say something for him. You said you were going to try. I'll just, you want to stay down there? Okay, there's the mic. First of all, I want to thank everybody that came. And the ones that wore blue, that meant to me in honor of my dad. My daddy knew I struggled a lot with my security of being a mother. And he told me all the time, you made mistakes. And that's part of life. That you have three beautiful, smart, intelligent kids that surprised me on a daily basis. But we were looking through videos. They were on the CD. We were looking for pictures of my daddy and different things. We came across when the kids were little. And it kept just showing all these different things that we did, all the times we spent together. And I just realized that was him letting me know that I was not a bad mother. And so I had to go outside to catch my breath. And I felt somebody sitting beside me and telling me, I told you so. And I felt this rush through me that made me just break down. Because... Even after he's gone, he knew what I needed. And he waited until he knew me as a mother, me as a daughter, and me as a wife. And one night, he proved that to me. And I just, that's, all, that's the main thing I wanted to say. And we've been through a lot, a lot. But no matter what, he was always there at any time. And I just want to thank him for knowing that man and that laugh. And somebody's supposed to be doing it for us. <clears throat> Not on the spot or anything. <laughs> but I just want to say he loved this church. He's the one that brought me here. <laughs> He's the main reason that I realized <laughs> that God has my back and he will never forsake me. So thank you, Daddy, for all of you've done. You're truly going to be missed. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Warren, what can you say about Mr. Warren? For those of you that don't know me, I'm the associate pastor here at the Apostolic Revival Center. 
We moved here uh, about probably a little over six years ago. And uh, not too long, me and my wife was just discussing this yesterday, not too long after we moved here, Mr. Warren started coming to our church. And we were just discussing how it's just, it's going to be so empty and so different now that he is gone and he's no longer with us. I won't be able to look to my left anymore while playing the piano and see him down there eyeballing me and just smiling and laughing and clapping his hands and worshiping the Lord. But Mr. Warren was a true testament of the love, the grace, and the mercy of the God that we serve. He loved his church. He loved everything about it. It didn't matter what it was. Mr. Warren was going to be here, and he was going to have his little pawpaw cup or his little Yeti. He had about two or three of them he went through in the years, but he was going to have that, and he was going to have him a cold Pepsi in there. And I used to call it Mr. Warren's sippy cup. And then for whatever reason, I don't know, towards, towards the end there, he switched to Coke. He said, I like Coke better now. I'm like, Mr. Warren, you can't be Mr. Warren and drink Coke. It just don't work. Mr. Warren always loved to give me a hard time. I, I think he would rather do that than breathe. Every time I would preach and end the service, I could see him stepping out right there, and he would make his way right up here. And he would say, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not the impressionist. I, I know who is and can do it. I, so, but he would say, phrase. One day you might make a good preacher, but it ain't going to be today. <laughs> I'm like, well, Mr. Warren, I appreciate that, sir. God bless you. I mean, I would think, you know, I did pretty good that one. No, Mr. Warren to keep me in line. So I thank God for Mr. Warren doing that. In Sunday school, he would take up the offering for the adult Sunday school class. And I'm telling y'all what, he would make a beeline for me every flipping time because he knows I don't carry cash. And he'd stand there with the plate and look at me. Freeze, you got any money today? No, Mr. Warren, you know I don't have no money, sir. How about bringing some next time, all right? All right. He loved to give me a hard time, and I loved every second of it. I told him. My my grandfather, he, he passed away uh, actually two years ago now. And after my grandfather died, you know, uh, Mr. Warren was giving me his condolences, and I told him, I said, Mr. Warren, I said, I count you as my grandpa now. <laughs> my grandpa loved to give me a hard time also. <laughs> he was ornery, just like Mr. Warren. He had the best way of doing everything. If you don't believe me, ask the guys that we rode up to Concord, North Carolina with Mr. Warren. And guess who got to sit right in front of Mr. Warren on the van? This guy. I, I don't know how. I, Mr. Warren knows everything there is to know from Manning, South Carolina to Concord, North Carolina. <laughs> I can't tell y'all how many times I heard, y'all just stay on 601, I'll take you straight into Concord. That's the way you need to go. And over here was the schoolhouse where Bessie Sue grabbed a frog and brought it into the classroom. And over, Sir, how do you remember all that? What in the world? But I love Mr. Warren dearly. I did. He uh, actually bought me this suit coat. And I, as soon as I heard of the passing of Mr. Warren, I said, I know what I'm wearing to the funeral. He came in. He said, Freeze, what size suit coat you wear? So, <laughs> well, about a 44 regular. He said, all right. And he turned around and walked away. <laughs> I think this was on a Wednesday night. Sunday morning, here he come. Big old smile on his face. Had this suit coat in the little belt bag. He said, I bought you something, Freeze. And I'm telling you what, I'm honored to wear this coat today in his memory. There won't be another one on this earth like Mr. Warren. I truly did love him, thought a lot about him, love his family. I love how he loved God. 
and loved his church. He, he was part of our family. He was, and he will be sorely missed. I love you, Mr. Warren. We'll give the immediate family one more opportunity if you want have want to say something for him. Anybody? We're good. All right. <clears throat> Amen. We're doing all of Warren's favorite songs today. And he loved the music here. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. Defender.
welcome everyone. Uh, extend our condolences to the family. Uh, it's a difficult time to lose someone so dear as Brother Warren. He was my best friend, and if you'll notice, I've got a jacket on just like his. He bought me one too. Matter of fact, he kind of reneged on me. He told me he was bringing me another jacket, but he checked out before he ever brought it. So I don't know. He forgot about me. Now, I tell you what, uh, Brother Warren, he was a deacon here. Hadn't been a deacon for long, but we had asked him if he would, and he accepted. And he was proud of that, to be an ordained deacon. But he was our best friend. Or he was a good daddy, a grandpa, a brother, a son, an uncle. Ecclesiastes 7 and 1 says that good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. I've watched him serve the Lord in the years he's been here. I'm, I'm the, one of the guys that stands between you and either eternity. Every week I get behind the pulpit, or my son does, and we try to pull you out of the pit. And that's what we did with Brother Warren. We read the scriptures to him. He was searching. He was looking. He knew something was missing. He wasn't happy. Matter of fact, I don't think Brother Warren had many happy times. But I do know this much. He stood up last Christmas over here in our Christmas banquet and said, for the first time in many years, he was happy. I don't know if any of you have ever dealt with depression, anxiety, life just catching up with you. It's an awful place to be when you feel like you don't have nobody and you're just down and out and full of anxiety. And he went through a lot of those times. But when he came here, his life took on a whole new direction. I was amazed at how much he knew about the Bible. You couldn't pull the wool over his eyes with if you tried to with the Scripture because he'd already been there and read it. He'd done been to church quite a bit and paid attention. But one thing I can report here today, my job is I want to tell you, I've not been to a funeral yet, and I don't think the funeral home guys back there will agree with me. I've not been to a funeral yet that anybody went to hell. You ever thought about that? They always want them to preach them into heaven. Well, it ain't my job to judge one way or another, right? I don't, you know... But I do know this, the word is forever settled in heaven, and it is our judge. And a man of God is to use it for correction and reproof and all these things and to teach someone how to get out of here. There's a lot of beliefs out there on how to go to heaven, okay? But if you're smart, you'll think, well, it can't every church on every corner be doing it the right way. Have you ever stopped and thought about that? And, you know, and I've got a, I was a deputy in the 80s, and I watched a lot of people die. Car wrecks, taking their lives. It depressed me for a while. But it made me realize one day I was going to leave just like Brother Warren has. One day I'm going to draw my last breath, and all that's going to matter is my works, what I did while I was here. It ain't going to matter how much money I left. It ain't going to matter how many houses I built. It doesn't matter if I lived in a trailer house or a three-story house and drove a Mercedes. All of that gets left here. And the quicker we figure that out, the better off we'll be. So I asked myself, what would Warren say today if he was here and could talk one more time? November the 7th, 2018, Brother Warren washed his sins away in baptism, according to Mark 16 and 16, John 3 and verse 3 and verse 5, according to Acts 2 and verse 38, and according to Acts 22 and verse 16, and Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, substantiated why he was baptized. He took on the name of his Lord and Savior. He took on the name, he became become the bride of Christ. 
And I watched him as he took that name on, that he took on a whole new life. He began to smile. He began to laugh. You know that laugh. And I'm going to just tell you right now, he could give you directions on how to drive to China. He could convince you. I liked Warren because he was straight up. He just shot straight. You know what I mean? He got right to the point. And that's the way he was when it come to his salvation. He said, you know what? I see in the Bible it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You don't need an interpreter for that at all. It says just what it says. You need better get baptized. How, how do I get baptized? Well, the way they did it in the Bible. Let's go find where they baptized people, and let's copy exactly what the apostles did. And that's what we did. On November the 7th, 2018, we washed those sins away, and it wasn't but just a few months later, I watched him be filled with the Spirit of God for the very first time. If you don't believe in God, get filled with the Spirit one time. You'll be a believer then. Oh, yeah. I thought I was a believer till I encountered him. And when I got filled with his spirit, August the 12th, 1990, at about five minutes after 12, I'll never forget it. I sure won't. But you know what? One of the things I loved about the Lord was he always taught a parable in Matthew 20 that it didn't really matter what time you came to him. Everybody got a penny at the end of the day. That's the, I love this Lord we serve. You know, so many of us wait later in life to take, we, we play with life, you know, and take a chance and wait till we get closer to the grave before we start getting serious about living for God. But I watched Warren live for the Lord, and I asked him, I said, Lord, Lord what would Warren have me to say here today? If Warren could talk right now, he would say this. He would say, I love you. But please listen to me. I've got something I need to tell you. Your life hangs by just a thread. The Bible says we're here for a little while and we're nothing more than a vapor or smoke and we fade away and we're gone. People's been doing it since the beginning of time. Since the Lord spoke Adam into existence and made him a wife, Eve. But he would tell you that everyone that comes here leaves with nothing. We've been sold a blind horse in our society. We work 40, 50 hours a day to have things we will never keep. And we gamble our salvation because it's designed to get our mind off of getting right with God and just having more working, you know, and going on vacation and buying that new car and in debt up to your eyeballs and you know, you got to work. You can't come to church on Sunday because the job I got makes me work on Sunday. Now, I've got to pay MasterCard and the car payment. But it pulls us into all of these things to where we forget about getting right with our Creator. That's the whole reason we came here. That's the whole reason God made us was to be with Him. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, chapter 90, verse 10 through 12, it says, the days of our years are threescore years and ten, or seventy. It says, and if by reason of strength, they by fourscore years, which would be eighty. It says, yet is there strength and labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. It says, who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts under wisdom. I can tell you, Warren broke the mold when he was made. He was a good old soul, and I loved him dearly. We both gave each other gifts, and we had a good time. He just asked me a few weeks ago, he said, you know what? He said, ribeyes are on sale. He said, we need to have a steak dinner down there with the men's class, you know? And I said, well, let's do it. Let's first get you out of the hospital and back. And I'll be quite honest with you, for a while I thought he was coming back, but he didn't. His body had reached a place to where it just could not sustain him any longer. I held his hand as he drew his last breath, and I watched 
And I witnessed as his spirit left his body. I can certify here today that I believe Warren is in heaven. I can't say a thousand percent he is. I don't, you know, I don't know. But I do know he obeyed the scriptures. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 5, unless a man's born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. It don't matter what we believe. It doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what's on the church sign. It doesn't matter what grandpa preached. It doesn't matter where grandma went or Aunt Sue went. It does not matter. All that matters is what the word says. And I can tell you this much. I'll go ahead and, and just serve you notice right now the devil, Lucifer. He knows the word of God. And he will be the prosecuting attorney at your judgment when you stand there. And he will bring up the word. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That's Mark 16 and 16, part of the Great Commission. The great thing I love about Brother Warren as I get ready to close is he didn't leave us here weeping and worrying about where he went. I've had to preach funerals before where I wasn't sure. I didn't know the individual. I hadn't watched them live for the Lord. I really wasn't a, a witness of them doing it, but I witnessed him live for six years. I watched him get filled with the Spirit. I watched him wash away his sins as we called the name of the Lord over him. And he started a brand new life. All those things from the past were washed away. He was blown away that he could do that. But Acts 2 and 38 tells us that if we repent of our sins and we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, why? For the remission of our sins, we shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's what's going to take us out of the grave. The Holy Spirit's what took his hand the other day in a hospital room as we stood there and he got him one last good deep breath and... Uh, it was like, finally I can breathe. Finally I can breathe. So today I want to give great honor to this man. I'll always remember him. I'll model my life after him. He was a good man. He really was. He was a good man, and I loved him greatly, and I think all of you do too. I do want to just say thanks to Elmore Cannon and Stevens back there for helping assist us and the family and being good to us and bringing him down here. Thank everybody for coming. This time I'm going to turn the service over to the pastor. We're going to make it. We're going to make it through this. Wow. I have had the great privilege of... Uh, watching uh, a lot of spiritual growth in Brother Warren's life. And uh, Brother Warren came in the picture when I was in my uh, my very young years of ministry. And so he would come up to me often, and he would tell me in that voice, and he'd say, uh, I'll get there in a minute. Don't rush me. It don't come out right when you just say, well, do it. But he would come up to me and he'd say, you know what? You you best be careful. And I'm thinking he's fixing to reprimand me. I did something wrong. I was long-winded or something because he was, you know, get in to shoot and get out. Let's, we got to go to D&H, man. They're going to eat up all the chicken. But he would tell me, say, boy, you better be careful. You're going to make a good pastor one day. And uh, it, it has been such a privilege to watch uh, the spiritual growth that Mr. Warren has gone through uh, the transformation and to be able to uh, go through it with him and uh, I, and I won't make this about me because it's not about me today and that's perfectly fine but I, I didn't have a great relationship with my two grandfathers uh, I'll be honest with you they didn't like me <laughs> I just put it that way they didn't like a whole lot of people 
And so I, I, I didn't strike gold in the grandparent department. But I can tell you this, Mr. Warren was more of a grandfather to me than I have ever had. He impressed my life. Warren was a fixer. Everywhere he went, just like you said, if there was something that he knew that he could help with, he wasn't going to sit back tight-lipped. He's going to tell you, boy, you better do it like this. I'm just going to tell you. You know why? Because he had done, been there and done it and failed doing it and learned from it, and he's trying to save you a little bit of time and show you how to do it the right way. So listen. Listen to what I'm telling you. 601. But it has just been a privilege to know him, and I'm going to miss him so greatly. Look over there on that second row on that end and, and watch him smile. And, you know, Warren had, uh, he had different textures to his laugh. He didn't have one laugh. He had different textures to the one laugh. Is that okay? Is that better? He might look at you someday, and he would just say, you know, you better fix that. <laughs> but then there'd be one other time, he'd say, Freeze, you got any money? He'd say, no. He'd go, ah. Different texture, different time, different moment. But he knew exactly what laugh to use for what moment. He did. And I believe you're right. He broke the mold. He did. Uh, I don't believe there'll be another person on this great earth that will walk around like Mr. Warren. He was a loving soul, and I appreciate him, and I appreciate the voice that he had in my life uh, because he, 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 he wasn't scared to talk to me. And I'm thankful for that. And uh, I, I do want to encourage the family that this is not the end. We got to make it there. He's waiting on us. And uh, I, I just, I, I, and I showed this, I told my mother this when we were in the room uh, on Thursday. And it was about 5.38 when he drew his last breath. I marked it down, 5.38 p.m. And I looked at her and I quoted this verse and I want to read it to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52. And I quoted the last part of it. It says here, In a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Here we go. You ready for it? Death is swallowed up in victory. And this is what I looked at her at 538 and I looked at her when Mr. Warren was transferred into the loving hands of Jesus. I looked at her and I said, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Because Mr. Warren wasn't arrested and locked up in that body. He sure wasn't. He's free. He's free right now. And he's in a place that we've got, we've got, we got to get there. I don't know about you. I'd love to take you with you, but with me, but if you don't make it, <laughs> I'm going. I'm going to see Warren. I'm going to hear that laugh again. I am. It's been a great celebration, and I would like to. I got one more verse I just want to encourage you with, and, and we're going to close and dismiss, but I, I, I'd like to take my time with this because this is a great special day. And I want to read from you from Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. And this is John writing this down. And he says that I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write. Here's what he wrote. He said, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. He says, Yea, saith the Spirit that they may rest from their labors. And listen, and their works do follow them. You know, so many people leave this place and all they left was boats and money and trinkets, and toys, and college degrees. But if there's something that Mr. Warren left us is that you, you, you got you to get out of here with me. Warren wasn't afraid to tell anybody about Jesus. He sure wasn't. He'd tell you like it was. You need to get it right. 
don't know what Bible you've been reading out of, but you ain't been reading out of mine. That's what he told me. Uh -huh. That's what he'd say. He sure would. And so we've got to get there. There wasn't anything that Warren wouldn't do for you. He'd do anything for you. He'd give you the shirt off his back. He would. And I watched him every Sunday morning, Wednesday. He would come in and he would sit right there and I would I would make it a point. I'd try to make it a point to talk to everyone, but I would make it a point to go talk to him. I'd say, Warren, Mr. Warren, how you doing? He said, I'm doing just fine. Every day. Didn't hear no complaining out of him. At least not in here. He might, when he got home with you, he might have. But he sure would. And he'd stand around and talk for a little bit, and then he was he was done. He's ready to go to the house. Ready to go to the house. He'd forget his sippy cup sometimes, and I'd I'd grab it. I said, Warren, you you forgot it. He'd say he'd go to walking fast too. He'd say, Oh, I got to get my cup. But it has been a great celebration. It has. It has been a wonderful day, and I want to uh, I want to leave this podium today, and I want to pray with you, and I, I want to encourage you that it's not the end. Yes, ma'am. didn't want to pass up this opportunity to express my love to Marvin. I knew him as Marvin. My mother, my name is Linda Wallace Lee Werdeman. My mother was Myrtle Mae Johnson Wallace. Mama was Marvin's oldest sister. Um, George Alexander Bud Johnson was married to my grandmother and then he was married to Willie May, who is uh, Willie May Thurl, who is Marvin's mother. So Willie May and George Alexander Johnson had 10 children. And George Alexander Bud Johnson and Mary Elizabeth Boone had four children. And my mother was the oldest of the four. And so Marvin lived with my mother um, for a while. Mother loved Marvin. I have known Marvin his whole life. I was born in 1947. He was born in 1951. So I've known Marvin his whole entire life. And he's had a rough life, but he has risen above that. I also knew Edna Johnson, Diana's mother. And I loved Eddie. Loved her with a passion. She was a good woman. She was good for Marvin. And Marvin was good to her. I love this family. I love my family. And I could not pass up this opportunity to tell Angie how proud I am of her and how she has stood by her dad and loved him and done for him and comforted him and buoyed him up and strengthened him. That's the best thing that children can do for their parents is to give back in their later years when they're suffering physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever it may be. But I do love my family, and this has been a beautiful service, and I am so grateful that I could be here to represent my mother who loved him very much, as we all do. My two sisters, Elaine and Shirley, love him very much too as well. And I just want to say this, and I know the gospel is true. And I'm grateful for my testimony of Jesus Christ. And I also know that families are forever. This is not the end. This is the beginning. And we are going to be able to see and be with Marvin again as a family. And I'm looking forward to that. He's there with Mother. He's there with Jerry. He's there with George Alexander Bud Johnson. He's there with Willie May. He's with all of them. And they're having a family reunion like they've never had before. And we can, we, we can take a joy in that. Even at this bad time when we're going to miss him, we can still find joy. And we have something to do ourselves. we got to work toward being so we can be with them when this life is said and done and Heavenly Father calls us home as well. I love my family. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I can tell you this. Your daddy has went down in the history books. But he's living beyond history right now. He's living in the future. We're going to see him. And I just want to encourage you, stick together. If there ever was a time for y'all to get together, strengthen one another, let there be let the peace of God just rest in your home amongst your, your family members, it's now. And 
God's going to help you. And I want to pray right now. In Jesus' name. God, we're so thankful, Lord, for this great celebration of this great life, Lord. Uh, God, you know we could talk for the next three days about everything about Mr. Warren that we loved. God, we, we just we thank you for the life that we were able to be somewhat a part of. We thank you, Jesus, for that opportunity, and I thank you for the life of Warren, Wayne, Johnson, Marvin. I thank you for him, Lord. And I thank you for the, the thumbprint that he left on society and on the world and in our hearts. And I'm so happy, God, that he not only left his thumbprint, but, God, he allowed you to leave your thumbprint on the face of society and in our hearts. I pray, Lord, for strength right now for the family and those abroad in the days ahead, Lord. God, let there be hope and let it be evident, God. Let there be comfort and strength in the days ahead, God. You know the things we're going to face. And I pray right now, Lord, you would just strengthen us for the days ahead. We're going to make it, Lord, and you're going to help us. And we are just willing to follow you, Jesus, because we're going to see Warren. We're going to see Marvin again one day. We love you, Lord, and I just ask you, Lord, for your blessing upon your people today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want you to stand with me now, please. And I want the funeral director, I'm going to turn it over to him now. And I want to extend this very quickly just to the immediate family. We have a meal provided next door just for the immediate family. So thank you. If you would like to stay, we've got it in boxes. If you're not able to stay, you can take it with you. But we've provided this for you for the immediate family to come over in just a moment. Okay.
was Warren's favorite song. <laughs> 